Hell of Mirrors by Ranpo Edo Ogawa One of the queerest friends I ever had was Kandanuma. From the very start I suspected that he was mentally unbalanced. Some might have called him just eccentric, but I am convinced he was a lunatic. At any rate, he had one mania, a craze for anything capable of reflecting an image, as well as for all types of lenses. Even as a boy the only toys he would play with were magic lanterns, telescopes, magnifying glasses, kaleidoscopes, prisms, and the like. Perhaps this strange mania of Tanu Mas was hereditary, for his great-grandfather Morib was also known to have had the same bread election. As evidence there is the collection of objects, primitive glassware and telescopes and ancient books on related subjects, which this Moribe obtained from the early Dutch merchants at Nagasaki. These were handed down to his descendants, and my friend Tanuma was the last in line to receive the heirlooms. Although episodes concerning Tanuma's craze for mirrors and lenses in his boyhood are almost endless, those I remember most vividly took place in the latter part of his high school days when he was deeply involved in the study of physics, especially optics. One day while we were in the classroom, Tanuma and I were classmates in the same school. The teacher passed around a concave mirror and invited all the students to observe the reflection of their faces in the glass. When my turn came to look I recoiled with horror, for the numerous festering pimples on my face, so greatly magnified looked exactly like craters on the moon seen through the gigantic telescope of an astronomical observatory. I might mention that I had always been extremely sensitive about my heavily pimpled face, so much so that the shock I received on this occasion left me with a phobia of looking into such concave mirrors. On one occasion not long after this incident I happened to visit a science exhibition, but when I spotted an extra-large concave mirror mounted in the far distance I took to my heels in holy terror. Tanuma, however, in sharp contrast to my sensitive feelings, let out a shrill cry of joy as soon as he got his first glance at the concave mirror in the classroom. Wonderful. Dot wonderful. He shrieked, and all the other students laughed at him. But to Tanuma the experience was no laughing matter, for he was in dead earnest. Subsequently his love for concave mirrors grew so intense that he was forever buying all sorts of paraphernalia, wire, cardboard, mirrors, and the like. From these he mischievously began constructing various devilish trick boxes with the help of many books which he had procured, all devoted to the art of scientific magic. Following Tanu Mas graduation from high school, he showed no inclination to pursue his academic studies further. Instead, with the money which was generously supplied him by his easygoing parents, he built a small laboratory in one corner of his garden and devoted his full time and effort to his craze for optical instruments. He completely isolated himself in his weird laboratory, and I was the only friend who ever visited him, the others having all given him up because of his growing eccentricity. On each of my visits I began to feel more and more anxious over his strange doings, for I could see clearly that his malady was going from bad to worse. About this time both his parents died, leaving him with a handsome inheritance. Now completely free from any supervision, and with ample funds to satisfy his every whim, he began to grow more reckless than ever. At the same time, having now reached the age of twenty, he began to show a keen interest in the opposite sex. This interest intermingled with his morbid grace for optics, and the two grew into a powerful force in which he was completely enmeshed. Immediately after receiving his inheritance he built a small observatory and equipped it with an astronomical telescope in order to explore the mysteries of the planets. As his house stood on a high elevation, it was an ideal spot for this purpose. But he was not one to be satisfied with such an innocuous occupation. Soon he began to turn his telescope earthward and to focus the lens on the houses of the surrounding area. Fences and other barriers constituted no obstacle, because his observatory stood on very high ground. The occupants of the neighboring houses, utterly unaware of Tanu Mas prying eyes peering through his telescope, went about their daily lives without any reserve, their sliding paper windows wide open. 
As a result Tanuma derived hitherto unknown pleasures from his secret explorations into the private lives of his neighbors. One evening he kindly invited me to take a look, but what I saw made me blush a deep crimson, and I refused to partake any more in his observations. Not long after he built a special type of periscope which enabled him to get a full view of the rooms of his many young maidservants while he was sitting in his lab. Unaware of this, the maids showed no restraint in whatever they did in the privacy of their own rooms. Another episode, which I can never erase from my mind, concerned insects. Tanuma began studying them under a small microscope, deriving childish delight from watching both their fighting and their mating. One particular scene which I had the misfortune of seeing was that of a crushed flea. This was a gory sight indeed, for, magnified a thousandfold, it looked like a large wild boar struggling in a pool of blood. Sometime after this, when I called on Tanuma one afternoon and knocked on his laboratory door, there was no answer. So I casually walked in, as was my custom. Inside, it was completely dark, for all the windows were draped with black curtains. And then suddenly on the large wall ahead of me there appeared some blurred and indescribable object, so monstrous in size that it covered the entire space. I was so startled that I stood transfixed. Gradually the thing on the wall began to take definite shape. The first shape that came into focus was a swamp overgrown with black weeds. Beneath it there appeared to immense eyes the size of wash tubs, with brown pupils glinting horribly, while at their sides there flowed many rivers of blood on a white plateau. Next came two large caves, from which there seemed to protrude the black bushy ends of large brooms. These, of course, were the hairs growing in the cavities of a gigantic nose. Then followed two thick lips, which looked like two large, crimson cushions, and they kept moving, exposing to rows of white teeth the proportions of roof dials. It was a picture of a human face. Somehow I thought I recognized the features despite their grotesque size. Just at this point I heard someone calling, Don't be alarmed, it's only me. The voice gave me another shock, for the large lips moved in synchronization with the words, and the eyes seemed to smile. Abruptly, without any warning, the room was filled with light, and the apparition on the wall vanished. Almost simultaneously Tanum emerged from behind a curtain at the rear of the room. Grinning mischievously, he came up to me and exclaimed with childish pride, Wasn't that a remarkable show? While I continued to stand motionless, still speechless with wonder, he explained to me that what I had seen was an image of his own face thrown on the wall by means of a stereotokan which he had had specially constructed to project the human face. Several weeks later he started another new experiment. This time he built a small room within the laboratory, the interior of which was completely lined with mirrors. The four walls, plus floor and ceiling, were mirrors. Hence, anyone who went inside would be confronted with reflections of every portion of his body, and as the six mirrors reflected one another, the reflections multiplied and remultiplied ad infinitum. Just what the purpose of the room was Tanoma never explained. But I do remember that he invited me on one occasion to enter it. I flatly refused, for I was terrified. But from what the servants told me Tanoma frequently entered the chamber of mirrors together with Kimiko, his favorite maid, a buxom girl of eighteen, to enjoy the hidden delights of Mirland. The servants also told me that at other times he would enter the chamber alone, staying for many minutes, often as long as an hour. Once he had stayed inside so long that the servants had become alarmed. One of them mustered up enough courage to knock on the door. Tanuma came leaping out, stark naked, and without even a word of explanation, fled to his own room. I must explain at this juncture that Tanuma's health was fast deteriorating. On the other hand his craze for optical instruments kept increasing in intensity. Continuing to spend his fortune on his insane hobby, he kept laying in bigger and bigger stocks of mirrors of all shapes and descriptions, concave, convex, corrugated, prismatic as well as miscellaneous specimens that cast completely distorted reflections. Finally, however, he reached the stage where he could no longer find any further satisfaction unless he himself manufactured his own mirrors. 
so he established a glass working plant in his spacious garden, and there, with the help of a select staff of technicians and workmen, began turning out all kinds of fantastic mirrors. He had no relative to restrain him in his insane ventures, and the handsome wages he paid his servants assured their complete obedience. Hence I felt it was my duty to try and dissuade him from squandering any more of his fast dwindling fortune. But Danuma would not listen to me. I was nevertheless determined to keep an eye on him, fearing he might lose his mind completely, and visited him frequently. And on each occasion I was a witness to some still madder example of his mirror-making orgy, each example becoming more and more difficult to describe. One of the things he did was to cover one whole wall of his laboratory with a giant mirror. Then in the mirror he cut out five holes, he would thrust his arms, legs, and head through these holes from the back side of the mirror, creating a weird illusion of a trunkless body floating in space. On other occasions I would find his lab cluttered up with a miscellaneous collection of mirrors of fantastic shapes and sizes corrugated, concave and convex types predominating and he would be dancing in their midst, completely naked, in the manner of some primitive pagan ritualist or witch doctor. Every time I beheld these scenes I got the shivers, for the reflection of his madly whirling naked body became contorted and twisted into a thousand variations. Sometimes his head would appear double, his lips swollen to immense proportions, again his belly would swell and rise, then flatten out, his swinging arms would multiply like those found on ancient Chinese Buddhist statues. Indeed, during such times the laboratory was transformed into a purgatory of freaks. Next, Tanuma rigged up a gigantic kaleidoscope which seemed to fill the entire length of his laboratory. This was rotated by a motor, and with each rotation of the giant cylinder the mammoth flower patterns of the kaleidoscope would change in form and hue red, pink, purple, green, vermilion, black like the flowers of an opium addict stream. And Tanuma himself would crawl into the cylinder, dancing the crazily among the flowers, his stark naked body and limbs multiplying like the petals of the flowers, making it seem as if he too were one of the flowery features of the kaleidoscope. Nor did his madness end here far from it. His fantastic creations multiplied rapidly, each on a larger scale than the previous one. Until about this time I had still believed that he was partly sane, but finally even I had to admit he had completely lost his mind. And shortly thereafter came the terrible, tragic climax. One morning I was suddenly awakened by an excited messenger from Tanuma's house. A terrible thing has happened. Miss Kimiko wants you to come immediately. The messenger cried, his face white as a sheet of rice paper. What's the matter? I asked, hurriedly getting into my clothes. We don't know yet, exclaimed the servant. But for God's sake, come with me at once. I tried to question the servant further but he was so incoherent that I gave up and hurried as fast as I could to Tanuma's laboratory. Entering that teary place, the first person I saw was Kimiko, the attractive young Palor maid whom Tanuma had made his mistress. Near her stood several of the other maids, all huddled together and gazing horror-struck at a large spherical object reposing in the center of the room. This sphere was about twice as large as the ball on which circus clowns often balance themselves. The exterior was completely covered with white cloth. What terrified me was the fantastic way this sphere kept rolling slowly and haphazardly, as if it were alive. Far more terrible, however, was the strange noise that echoed faintly from the interior of the ball. It was a laugh, a spine-chilling laugh that seemed to come from the throat of a creature from some other world. What, what's going on? What in the world is happening? I asked the stunned group. We, we don't know, one of the maids replied dazedly. We think our master's inside. But we can't do anything. We've called several times, but there's been no answer except the weird laughter you hear now. Hearing this, I approached the sphere gingerly, trying to find out how the sounds got out of the sphere. Soon I discovered several small air holes. Pressing my eye to one of these small openings, I peered inside, but I was blinded by a brilliant light and could see nothing clearly. However, it did a certain one thing. There was a creature inside exclamation mark Tanuma. 
Tanuma? I called out several times, putting my mouth against the hole. But the same weird laughter was all that I could hear. Not knowing what to do next, I stood, uncertainly watching the ball roll about. And then suddenly I noticed the thin lines of a square partition on the smooth exterior surface. I realized at once that this was a door, allowing entry into the sphere. But if it's a door, where's the knob? I asked myself. Examining the door carefully, I saw a small screw hole which must have held some kind of a handle. At the sight of this I was struck by a terrible thought. It's quite possible, I told myself, that the handle has accidentally come loose, trapping inside whoever it is that entered the sphere. If so, the man must have spent the entire night inside, unable to get out. Searching the floor of the laboratory, I soon found a T-shaped handle. I tried to fit it to the hole, but it would not work, for the stem was broken. I could not understand why in the world the man inside, if indeed it was a man, didn't shout and scream for help instead of letting out those weird chuckles and laughs. Maybe, I suddenly reminded myself with a start, Tanuma is inside and has gone stark raving mad. I quickly decided that there was but one thing to do. I hurried to the glass works, picked up a heavy hammer, and rushed back into the lab. Aiming carefully, I brought the hammer down on the globe with all my might. Again and again I struck at the strange object, and it was soon reduced to a mass of thick fragments of glass. The man who crawled out of the debris was indeed none other than Danuma. But he was almost unrecognizable, for he had undergone a horrible transformation. His face was pulpy and discolored. His eyes kept wandering aimlessly. His hair was a shaggy tangle. His mouth was agape, the saliva dripping down in thin, foamy ribbons. His entire expression was that of a raving maniac. Even the girl Kimika recoiled with horror after taking one glance at this monstrosity of a man. Needless to say, Tanuma had gone completely insane. But how did this come about? I asked myself. Could the mere fact of confinement inside this glass sphere have been enough to drive him mad? Moreover. What was his motive in constructing the globe in the first place? Although I questioned the servants still huddled close to me, I could learn nothing, for they all swore they had known nothing of the globe, not even that it had existed. As though completely oblivious of his whereabouts, Tanuma began to wander about the room, still grinning. Kimiko overcame her initial fright with great effort and tearfully tugged at his sleeves. Just at this moment the chief engineer of the glass works arrived on the scene to report for work. Ignoring his shock at what he saw, I started to fire questions at him relentlessly. The man was so bewildered that he could barely stammer out his replies. But this is what he told me. A long time ago Tanuma had ordered him to construct this glass sphere. Its walls were half an inch thick and its diameter about four feet. In order to make the interior a one-unit mirror, Tanuma had the workmen and engineers paint the exterior of the globe with quicksilver, over which they pasted several layers of cotton cloth. The interior of the globe had been built in such a way that there were small cavities here and there as receptacles for electric bulbs which would not protrude. Another feature of the globe was a door just large enough to permit the entrance of an average-sized man. The engineers and workers had been completely unaware of the purpose of the product, but orders were orders, and so they had gone ahead with their assignment. At last, on the night before, the globe had been finished, complete with an extra-long electric cord fitted to a socket on the outer surface, and it had been carefully brought into the lab. They plugged the cord into a wall socket, and then departed at once, leaving Tanuma alone with the sphere. What happened later was, of course, beyond the realm of their knowledge. After hearing the chief engineer's story, I asked him to leave. Then, putting Tanuma in the custody of the servants, who led him away to the house proper, I continued to stand alone in the laboratory, my eyes fixed on the glass fragments scattered about the room, desperately trying to solve the mystery of what had happened. For a long while I stood thus, wrestling with the conundrum. Finally I reached the conclusion that Tanuma, after having completely exhausted every new idea in his mania of optics, had decided that he would construct a glass globe, completely lined with a single unit mirror, which he would enter in order to see his own reflection. 
Why would a man become crazy if he entered a glass globe lined with a mirror? What in the name of the devil had he seen there? When these thoughts passed through my mind, I felt as if I had been stabbed through the spine with a sword of ice. Did he go mad after taking a glance at himself reflected by a completely spherical mirror? Or did he slowly lose his sanity after suddenly discovering that he was trapped inside his horrible round glass coffin together with that reflection? What, then, I asked myself again, had he seen? It was surely something completely beyond the scope of human imagination. Assuredly, never before had anyone shut himself up within the confines of a mirror-lined sphere. Even a trained physicist could not have guessed exactly what sort of vision would be created inside that sphere. Yeah. Probably it would be a thing so unthinkable as to be utterly out of this world of ours. So strange and terrifying must have been this reflection, of whatever shape it was, as it filled Tanoma's complete range of vision, that it would have made any mortal insane. The only thing we know is the reflection cast by a concave mirror which is only one section of a spherical hole. It is a monstrously huge magnification. But who could possibly imagine what the result would be when one is wrapped up in a complete succession of concave mirrors? My hapless friend, undoubtedly, had tried to explore the regions of the unknown, violating sacred taboos, thereby incurring the wrath of the gods. By trying to pry open the secret portals of forbidden knowledge with his weird mania of optics he 